217 to dispatch. Go ahead, 217. How old was she? I don't want to get into any of that yet. Right, okay. Whether that child was 18 months, mm -hmm. two years, three years, mm -hmm. or perhaps we're mixing it up with a nine-year-old child. Mm -hmm. You've done it to all of them, haven't you? Come on and bag a bag and buckle down. Keep it hush now, come on the ground. Everybody's looking for you now. I was having nightmares until we caught scummy. And they're hunting you down in your own town. They're trying to chase you out. They never go for it. Peter Gerard Scully was born on January 13th, 1963, in Melbourne, Australia. He lived in the suburb of Nary Warren with his wife and two children. There was nothing about Peter that appeared straight up malevolent at the time, but people that lived in the same neighborhood as he did remember him as a sketchy character. Direct reasons for this were never given. At some point before 2011, Scully had left his family and began delving into the darker side of what we know about this monster. He had a teenaged girlfriend or sugar baby from Malaysia named Ling. He used to pimp Ling out as an escort and use her for sex parties. While Scully was never charged with any sex crimes in his home country that we know of, Several former associates of his claim he had a disturbing sexual history that not many outside of that circle were aware of. It's also reported that he had an illegal online escort service he used to find tricks for Ling. It was around this time that Scully was involved in a property scam that ripped off over two and a half million dollars from around 20 investors. And apparently that wasn't Peter's first rodeo involving fraud either. A previous real estate scam saw the scumbag being brought up before the Supreme Court where a judge described him as willing and prepared to push the boundaries of commercial morality. But, as you'll soon find out, Scully lacked any sense of morality. And when it came to his own sick idea of pleasure, there were no boundaries that didn't excite him to break. In 2009, an investigation was launched by an Australian Securities and Investment Commission. It saw Peter Scully charged with 117 offenses. But before the snake could be slapped with a conviction, it slithered away to Manila in 2011, beyond the reach of Australian police. Warrants were put in place that would see Scully promptly detained should he ever set foot back in an Australian airport, but he never returned. And this is when the darkness began to thicken. When Peter arrived in the Philippines, he made his way to Cagayan de Oro, on the island of Mindanao, where he met a 14-year-old girl named Carmian Ann Alvarez. Carmian lived on the streets and sold her body as a means to get by. I'm not sure if Carmian went with Scully willingly or he kidnapped her, but it seems clear that at the start of their relationship, the young girl was forced to do whatever Scully wanted her to do sexually. Make no mistake, Carmian Ann Alvarez was abused by Scully and was definitely one of his victims. But that doesn't change what she did to others. Before long, Peter had broken Carmian's will and what appears to be a trauma bond formed between the two. She began to submit herself to Scully and willfully adhere to his commands with zero resistance. After Scully renamed her Angel, Carmian and Alvarez became one of his two main accomplices, complicit in some of the most disturbing acts the world would not only hear about, but sadly, many would witness. At some point, the pair recruited another teenage prostitute named Lazelle Margallo, who Scully later dubbed Lovely. The Wicked Trio and other collaborators moved to Malay Belay to set up a base for a business so dark in nature that it's hard to believe it even existed. But it unfortunately did, and it was rooted below the surface of the internet you surf on right now in a place called the Deep Web. Most of you probably know this already, but the Deep Web is a place you can't reach without the use of an app like the Tor Browser. But once inside, you'll find pages completely blank of anything other than onion links. These links are like layers of an onion that when you peel back, might take you to God knows where. Oftentimes, clicking one link will just direct you to another identical page full of links. 
Other times you'll find yourself on sites where you're offered services like hiring a hitman or ordering drugs or counterfeit money. You can truly find anything down there in the Marianas Trench of the internet. And some pages are blatant scams waiting to steal your money or hack into your computer while others really mean business. But it goes without saying that you gotta be real careful surfing the onion rooter and peeling back its rotten layers. There's dark corners down there that you probably don't want to be sticking your nose in. You'll find pages dedicated to supporting terrorism, weapons trade, human trafficking, cannibalism, and plenty of dirty, rotten, evil pedophile groups. Simply clicking the wrong link could flag your computer and see you slapped with a charge that you can't talk your way out of. Be careful and just stay away from the deep web. There's no end to the disturbia found beneath the surface of the safe web, but near the bottom of the trench is something called Hurtcore. I'm not going to make this video as an in-depth view into Hurtcore. It's the most disgusting and sick topic I've ever heard discussed. It goes well beyond anything I've ever covered. What I will do is cite the Hurtcore wiki page for a definition of what exactly this is. Hurtcore, a portmanteau of the words hardcore and hurt, is a name given to a particularly extreme form of child pornography usually involving degrading violence, bodily harm and murder relating to child sexual abuse. The material is usually so extreme, even most pedophiles have been said to be repulsed by this genre of pornography and condemn its topic in most discussions. Eileen Ormsby, Australian writer and author of The Darkest Web, described Hurtcore as a fetish for people who get aroused by the infliction of pain or even torture on another person who is not a willing participant. An additional motivation for the perpetrator, next to their position of power over their victim, can be the reaction of their victim to the physical abuse, like crying or screaming of pain. This reaction can stimulate the arousal of the perpetrator even more. To my knowledge, Hurtcore isn't just limited to children or even humans. There are awful videos circulating around the internet that depict animals in some of the worst and most extreme cases of abuse I've ever heard of. These also fall under the same category. This is a far-reaching topic that I could probably do four videos on at least, but for this upload, I'll focus primarily on Peter Scully's dealings and the people that directly link to him. Peter Scully is said to have become a producer of content on Hurt to the Core, a site that operated on the darkest part of the deep web. As you've probably guessed, Hurt to the Core revolved around Hurtcore. It had forums, a chat room, and even video streaming that displayed things I'm sure most of us can't even imagine. Hurt to the Core was run by one central figure only known as Lux. Before Lux was caught, the feds knew he lived in South Morang, just outside of Melbourne. The house they traced him to had a wife and two kids, one son and one daughter. The father was a mechanic in his 50s. They figured it had to be him, someone who's been around the block a few times. They knew Lux wasn't making the content for the site, but he was certainly in charge of the whole thing. When authorities ripped off layers of encryption to find that hurt to the course feed was coming from the house, they knew the person that had been hurting so many children was comfortably dwelling behind the doors of that family home on that quiet suburban cul-de-sac. But Detective Christine Stafford had a feeling that the father in question may not actually be the droid they were looking for. She believed the real culprit and identity of Lux was the 21-year-old son, Matthew Graham. His online footprint was size zero. His presence online was almost non-existent, apart from an airtight Facebook profile that was hidden behind the security of privacy settings. Just what was Matthew Graham keeping so snug? Authorities needed to find out. In August of 2014, police raided the South Morang family home, and within minutes, their suspicions were confirmed. 21-year-old Matthew Graham was indeed Lux, the owner of Hurt to the Core. He was a nanotech student attending La Trobe University only. At the time, he hadn't actually been doing much attending. Instead, he stayed housed up in his room, glued to his laptop. Matthew had no criminal record. He was also a star VCE student in high school. He was squeaky clean. He even babysat his neighbor's little kids. Matthew didn't have many friends, but he did have anxiety, depression, and a schizoid personality disorder. But that just meant his emotional expression was limited, and Matthew tended to shy away from others. From the outside looking in, Matthew Graham was a nobody with high grades, but in the deep end of the dark web, 
he was one of the biggest sharks in the pool. While in police custody, Matthew refused to unlock his laptop, but he did freely surrender his phone and passcode. He must have thought he'd thoroughly washed and sanitized the device beyond the reach of the police, but Matthew Graham was wrong. In the phone's cache were three images that damned him to hell. Two were of dead children, and the third was of someone standing on a baby. He was charged with possession of child abuse material and failure to comply with an order in regard to the laptop. While the police were pretty sure they had Lux, they still weren't certain beyond the shadow of a doubt. They needed something bigger, and the charges laid upon Matthew at the time just weren't sizable enough. He'd be out of custody in no time if they couldn't pin bigger crimes on him. And if he got out, so would his laptop. With freedom and his computer in possession, Matthew could erase any trace of his major wrongdoings. Justice was running out of time. Hard drives seized from his bedroom were sent to Europol in Germany and the FBI in Washington, but neither were successful at unlocking the data. Then somehow the FBI made a huge breakthrough. They never revealed exactly how they did it, but somehow they were able to conclude with a high degree of certainty that Matthew Graham was in fact Lux. They had the owner of Hurt to the Core in their custody. I heard that the truth is Matthew made a mistake on 4chan stupidly revealing himself as Lux and really, that's how he got caught. I don't know, I'm not sure. Either way, they had him and now, they didn't have to let him go. When Matthew Graham's house was raided, he was sitting at the height of his career owning a host of different sites called the Pedo Empire. These sites were receiving almost half a million hits a day. In 2013, the dork even called a US cyber tip hotline himself and offered to tell all in exchange for immunity and bitcoin. You see, Matt the Rat thought of himself not as a pedophile, but as a champion of free speech. He wanted to be the biggest and the best, even once taunting authorities online by saying, Well, it looks like this empire hasn't fallen just yet. To any law enforcement agencies reading this, fuck you. But little did Humpty Dumpty know that the wall he was sitting on was about to collapse. Detective Stafford visited Matthew in jail while he was on remand for the aforementioned charges. Upon convincing him that she knew he was Lux, she explained to him that he might be tried in the USA and serve his time there if he didn't cooperate in Australia and surrender the password to his laptop. She was so confident she had a piece of pen and paper ready, and cocky Matthew gave in, writing down all 64 characters of his password that were only ever recorded in his mind before that moment. Letters, symbols, and numbers that were the key to bringing down the gate that guarded his sick little empire. Detective Stafford had it on paper, but she made Matthew type it into his own laptop and unlock it for her. The secrets were out. While Matthew claims he himself wasn't into the content he hosted online, he admitted to having pedophilic urges when he was younger, but authorities say he was one of the worst pedophiles of all time. He admitted to 13 crimes in total. One saw him advising a Russian man on how to abduct, rape, and kill a five-year-old girl. Another saw him encouraging a British man to rape a disabled girl he cared for who couldn't talk. Matthew wanted the men to video these sick acts so he could host them on his sites. We're talking about a seriously disturbed individual. Matthew Graham and Peter Scully are the worst kind of pedos. They're sadists. They are sexually aroused and their whole lives are motivated by inflicting pain, torture, and extreme humiliation on their victims. Victims that were primarily children. The clip you're about to see shows exactly how a sadistic child sex offender operates and just how dangerous people like this can be. This man is like Matthew Graham and Peter Scully. What you are going to hear is extremely upsetting and traumatic. You may want to skip this part of the video. I've included it for educational value and awareness. We need to do everything in our power to protect children from monsters like this. Proceed with caution. Use the progress bar at the bottom to jump forward if you feel you need to. Offenders inflict great emotional damage on children because of the sexual abuse and the betrayal of trust it involves. However, there is another type of offender who not only inflicts emotional abuse, but damages the victim physically as well. This next man, Gerald, is a sadistic sex offender. As he'll tell us, he is sexually aroused by inflicting pain. The victim he's describing is his nine-year-old stepson. After about two years of molesting my son and all the pornography that I had been buying, renting, swapping, 
I had gotten my hands on some bondage and discipline pornography with children involved. Some of the reading that I had done and the pictures that I had seen showed total submission, forcing the children to do what I wanted. And I had eventually started using some of this bondage and discipline with my own son. And uh, it had escalated to the point where I was putting a large Ziploc bag over his head and taping it around his neck with black duct tape or black electrical tape and raping and molesting him at that point uh, to the point that he would turn blue, pass out. Uh, at that point, I would rip the bag off his head, uh, not for fear of hurting him, but because of the excitement. I was extremely aroused by inflicting pain. And uh, when I seen him pass out and change colors, that was very arousing and heightening to me. And I would rip the bag off his head and then I'd jump up on his chest and I'd masturbate in his face and, and uh, make him suck my penis while he was, you know, as he started to come back awake. While he was coughing and choking, I would rape him in the mouth. I, uh, I used the same sadistic style act of the plastic bag and the tape two, three times a week. And that went on for, I'd say a little over a year. If I hadn't been arrested when I was, my stepson would be dead. I would have killed him. I had been fantasizing about killing a victim during the course of, of rape or molest about five or six months, uh, all during the course of the molestation of my stepson when I was using the zip layer, the plastic bag over his head. Uh, I had fantasized and thought about killing him, let him go ahead and suffocate during the process of the molestation. Uh, I believe it would have been maybe as short as another month or two, and I would have actually killed him if I was not arrested. Gerald's sadistic attacks continued despite the fact that his stepson reported him repeatedly. No one believed the child. It was reported to my wife and my parents uh, probably six or seven different times. Uh, and there was actually one instance where I went to the police station myself to turn, my turn myself in. And the police day, the officer at the desk told me to go home and sleep off my drunk. And I left. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that they had found, my landlord had found some pornographic pictures of my son in the attic of the home where we were living, I would probably still be molesting. As you might expect, Gerald didn't confine his sexual assaults to the home. In fact, he had a lengthy history of attacking children outside the home as well. He had molested children from ages 4 to 16, with a preference for 10 to 14-year-old boys. I've been raping and molesting for over a period of 25 years, and I have in excess of 300 victims. Hands-on victims? All hands-on victims. Okay. How did you get access to so many victims? Uh, children are on the street all the time. I made, uh, created my own opportunities. There were children at stores. Uh, I had picked some children up at the stores, at the uh, penny arcades, and I have snatched some off the street. Now, did you, by pick them up, do you mean by grooming, you talk them into it, or do you mean violently grab them and kidnap them? Sometimes, there, there had been some violent kidnapping snatching a child off the street, pulling him into my car, taking him to a deserted area, raping and molesting him, and then taking him back to where I had snatched him from. Uh, there had been uh, incidents where I would groom the child with toys, money. I'd see a child in a store uh, standing around the, the toy displays, and I would offer to buy the toy that this child would, may be looking at and would actually walk up to the counter and pay for the toy and walk out of the store with the child and the toy. And then I would, after, after I had taken the child to a deserted area or a, whole, a house that I had actually fixed up for the purpose of raping and molesting children, 
I would take the child back to the store where I had got him from and leave him off at the front door and leave. Gerald covered up his raping and molesting by living what might be called the double life. Friends and associates had no clue he was a violent man. Uh, I believe I, I feel more than I led a triple life. Uh, okay. I had to be, I was one way at home, I was one way at work, and I was a different way in the community. Matthew Graham and Peter Scully are the worst kind of pedos. But how exactly does Graham link to Scully? Well, I'll get to that. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. I make true crime videos for a living, but I've always been interested in this type of content. As a matter of fact, I prefer a good documentary over a Hollywood blockbuster any day. That's why I'm proud to have this video sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a rising star in the world of on-demand streaming. This documentary-based streaming service was founded by filmmakers and happens to have a bunch of true crime documentaries about cases I'd never even heard of. With up to 20 hours of ad-free content added weekly and 4K quality included in your subscription, it's no wonder Magellan TV is the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. And as for true crime enthusiasts, Magellan TV is all about the drama of real life. From quests for justice to the nature of the criminal mind of a serial killer, this hidden jewel of the streaming world really has it all. I just finished watching Murder of Lee Irving. It's a true crime documentary about a 24-year-old man with a learning disability from Newcastle who was beaten to death before being dumped off next to a footpath in England. And while I was watching this, I couldn't help but wonder who could hurt someone so charming, so naive, so defenseless, and so totally totally vulnerable. Lee Irving's family refused to give up hope. This doc is a must-watch on Magellan TV. Outside of that, I recommend Tortured to Death or Murder on the Internet. But remember, it's not just true crime on Magellan TV. They've got packed categories like history, science, space, travel, and more. Magellan TV is simply ad-free documentaries on demand that you can watch from anywhere. Be it TV, tablet, phone, laptop, whatever. The app's even compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS, so feel free to take it with you on the go. And Magellan has gift cards available all year round too, so seeing as it's that time of year, I think I might get one for my mom, Nana Black. Annual memberships are only $59.88 or $4.99 a month, and that gives you access to over 3,500 hours worth of quality documentaries. And on top of that, if you want to go check them out, Magellan TV are offering the Disturbing Truth followers one month absolutely free. All you gotta do is click the link in the description or pinned comment down below. Magellan TV, thank you for repeatedly sponsoring this channel. Welcome back to the disturbing truth. As I stated before, Scully and his two accomplices, Carmian and Lysel, were creating a business on the dark web called No Limits Fun. Scully realized he could make a lot of money while living out his sick fantasies on film, especially if he pushed his content out as pay-per-view on the dark web. So in order to get victims for his business, he used Carmian and Lazelle to help lure young girls off the street with the promise of food or a place to stay. If these forgotten kids disappeared, people weren't likely to notice. And just like in Colombia with Luis Garavito and Pedro Lopez, no one cared about poor malnourished children on the streets. Sometimes Scully even procured children from poor families in exchange for little money and a better quality of life for the family's young ones. Little did these desperate parents know their kids were being abused beyond comprehension. And to prepare the children for the acts the crew would perform on them, the kids were made to view pornographic material. But I gotta say, from here on out, this story's gonna get a lot worse. In 2012, Scully asked Carmian if they could recruit some street children. Carmian offered her own sister instead, but Scully thought it would be better if she would go out and get some unwanted kids no one would miss. So Carmian Alvarez did what she was told. She tricked two little girls near a shopping center in Cagayan de Oro and lured them back to Scully's. There was Rosie and her cousin we'll call Amber. The two were roughly aged 9 and 12, pretty much the exact ages Scully was looking for. What these kids were put through over the course of five days is truly heartbreaking. On the first night, Scully forced the cousins to take baths as he videotaped them. The two were kept naked in dog collars and chains throughout their captivity. The next morning after breakfast, Scully made the cousins start digging two holes in the backyard possibly as a punishment for attempting to run away. These little girls were made do this every day. Peter also made them kiss each other and perform oral sex on him as he continued to record videos and take pictures of their horrific ordeal. Carmian actually tried to smother Rosie with a pillow to stop her from screaming while Peter continued to abuse her. 
This happened repeatedly. On the evening of the second or third day in captivity, Rosie and Amber were forced to drink alcohol. Rosie passed out from intoxication and woke up the next day in the hole she'd been digging. Apparently her captors thought she had died and they were about to cover her up. But Rosie was told she'd been put in there because she wouldn't stop crying for her mother the night before. They made her get up and continue to dig. It was no secret. The crew told the children exactly what the holes were for. The cousins were being forced to dig their own graves. And in between bouts of that and other abuse, they were humiliated and violated in the worst ways. Rosie wanted to end herself to stop the suffering, but her captors just continued to film. These acts were recorded for No Limits Fun. Various clips like these would be uploaded to the dark web where consumers would pay up to $10,000 to view them. On the fourth day, as the girls continued to dig, they continued to be videoed. At some point, Rosie and Amber were brought inside. Their hands and feet were tied with nylon rope. But on the fifth day, miraculously, these two young souls were able to escape. Some say this was a drunken mistake where someone left the door open. But Carmian Alvarez claims she did it on purpose when she saw the little girls in dog collars. She claims she'd been gone for two days and when she returned, she felt pity and decided to let the little girls go free. Either way, the cousins were somehow able to escape and run to where their parents worked in a local market. When the police arrived looking for the monsters, Scully was gone. Lazelle was nowhere to be seen. But Carmian Alvarez was caught. Authorities were quickly closing in on the No Limits Fun crew. But Rosie and her cousin weren't the only victims that got away from Scully and his witches. Arlene Loyola had around seven children. The poor family had been living on around two dollars a day when she was approached by Scully. She willingly handed her eight-year-old daughter over to Peter at the promise of food and a better education. But two weeks later, with a heavy feeling of dread in her heart, she knew something wasn't right. She returned and took her daughter back. But Arlene discovered that her little girl had also been beaten and raped repeatedly. She's never forgiven herself for this. There were also another two children who were voluntarily given to Scully. The three little girls were related. Barbie, aged 12. Liza, aged 11 and Daisy, who was 18 months old, all surrendered to the torture crew by struggling guardians seeking a better way of life for the children. These innocent children were all subjected to similar treatment as Rosie and her cousin, but Barbie was reportedly forced to torture the two younger ones in every way possible. All this too was filmed for No Limits Fun. Carmian and Lazelle both appeared masked in these videos. Barbie, who's been referred to as Cindy in some articles, had recently suffered the loss of her mother and had been living with her aunt. When Lazelle approached the struggling aunt and offered to adopt Barbie, the aunt obliged, obviously thinking it was the best for the 12-year-old. But still, what you've heard so far is far from the worst of it. Scully used the youngest girl Daisy to film a series of videos that were uploaded to the web called Daisy's Destruction. The tagline at the start of the sick video reads, Come see a child's mental ruin, her innocence lost, used as a tool, she'll learn how to please her mistress, her body will be ravaged, her dignity stolen. The video is available on the dark web, I have not watched it, nor will I ever. And if you do, you're likely committing a criminal offense. What I do know is that Daisy was hurt in ways that you could never imagine. Warning, what you're about to hear is deeply traumatizing, but by no means covers everything I've read. In order to skip and avoid the worst, I've provided a progress bar on the screen to direct you to the end of these awful details. This will begin in 3, 2, 1. 18 month old Daisy was tied up, had duct tape placed over her mouth, and was hung upside down with her limbs spread apart. Masked 19 year old Lizelle then proceeded to torture the baby following the instructions of cameraman Peter Scully. Daisy was waterboarded and hurt with various objects for hours including sex toys and barbed wire. She was also penetrated with alligator clips and raped. Her private areas were whipped and hot wax was dripped onto them. This part of the poor child's body was also set on fire. The main abuser during these acts was Lazelle Margallo. Scully was only seen in glimpses when he was raping Daisy. When the video made its way into the hands of authorities, it was clear that the pale man in the video was not from the Philippines. And when he spoke, it was easy to pick out his Australian accent. People all across the world were paying to view this video 
and videos just like it. But authorities never would have even known this video existed if it hadn't been leaked on Hurt to the Core via Matthew Graham himself. He posted the pay-per-view video up hoping it would drive more traffic to his site. And it did. Traffic with red and blue sirens. Thanks to that creep piece of shit, law enforcement were already tracking Scully. When Rosie and her cousin escaped that torture house and told police what happened to them, it directly led to the rest of Carmi and Alvarez. And while in custody, she sang a song guiding feds right to that lanky Mac and me looking loser, Peter Gerard Scully, who was arrested on February 20th of 2015 in Malibalay, quite literally with his pants down. Twentieth of February, four years after fleeing Australia and committing unspeakable crimes. Oh, one more, one more, one more, one more. This is the moment Scully is caught. Huh? Give me your name. It's Peter Scully. What? It's Peter Scully. Peter Scully. Scully. We have six warrants for your arrest. Wow. Okay. Already, investigators believe they have a watertight case against this father of two. You put on your pants. Yeah but they also fear there are more victims to be found, alive or dead. Can I get my cigarette? I've never seen a man look so satisfyingly bitch in my life. I mean, this guy had on stained tidy whities I mean, just such a moldy looking wart this guy is. Anyway, the ringleader and one of his accomplices had been captured. Lizelle Margallo was arrested too, but with no evidence at the time. Even after confessing that she played a role in Peter's Australian porn business, they let her walk. And by the time official charges were filed against her and 16 pending warrants were officially issued for her arrest, Lizelle had gone into hiding. Unlike Carmi and Alvarez, Lizelle Margallo appeared to show zero remorse for what she did. While on the run, she started using the name Shannon Carpio and claimed to be the wife of a French software millionaire. She even saw herself as some kind of online fitness influencer with a Facebook page she posted too often, as if she wasn't an evil child torturer. I mean, her page is still there, and a lot of her posts appeared to be unremorseful inside taunts. Lizelle had been living the fancy life in Cebu City at a high-end apartment. She worked out at the city's top commercial gym while she traveled and attended parties. She was also a tour guide at the time who serviced her clients with extra privileges for the right price. Her roommate back then had no idea the sweet woman she lived with was capable of such awful things. They had become best friends. But Shannon Carpio's best friend never knew the monster she shared a home with. Margallo, posing as Carpio, spun a web that her father was a policeman and her mother a social worker. According to the roommate, Margallo actually did marry a French guy who left the country for work but his identity has never been revealed. Despite the marriage, at the time, Lazelle was open about her relationship with her boyfriend, Peter Scully. She took her and her roomie and they stayed in fancy hotels and ate fancy meals, even going as far as to plan holidays to Hong Kong and Thailand. All this paid for by Lazelle's unseen boyfriend, Peter Scully. But on January 24th of 2017, on the day of my own birthday, her low-life high time came to an end when she was arrested at Sunset Beach Resort on Malapascoa Island, where she was reportedly being courted around by two young white guys. She was going by the name Gina Carpio then, even had a passport in that name. Wonder where she got that. She was heading to lunch when an agent walked straight up to her and asked if she was Gina. She said yes and was handcuffed on sight. Margallo's near two-year holiday was finally over. A lawsuit was filed depicting sexual and physical abuse of eight children between the ages of one and 13. Their ordeals were all recorded on video and uploaded to the internet. This went on from April of 2011 until September of 2014. Police alleged that while on the run, Lazelle Margallo actually continued to recruit potential victims for more films that were to be made by No Limits Fun. Even while in police custody, Peter Scully was continuing to operate and profit from his evil business. During this time, he communicated with Lazelle via WhatsApp, Facebook, and Skype. The official charges filed by the DOJ included other suspects involved in the case. They were Maria Dorothea V. Chia. She co-conspired with Scully in recruiting children for cybersex activities. She was arrested, charged, and sentenced to nine years for her roles in the crimes. 
Alexander Leo, a taxi driver who drove Scully and assisted in the trafficking. He was arrested and sentenced to nine years as well. Christian Johann Rothi, a German client identified by a victim who was sold to Rothi for around $1,800. She managed to escape when she was told that the German was coming for her. While there are warrants for his arrest in the Philippines, Christian has not been caught. Ayel Caetano de Oliveira, a Brazilian doctor who regularly sent money to Scully to fund the production of the NLF content. As a part of an operation called Mr. Hyde, Haniel was arrested in Brazil when he was 29 with 37,000 images and 700 videos of children on his computer. According to reports, Haniel was still in med school when he got involved with Scully. He taught the NLF crew how to obtain drugs to use on children. Videos found on his hard drives were also big keys that led Interpol and the feds in Manila to Peter Scully. And finally, Marshall Ruskin. Ruskin, a Canadian from Winnipeg, traveled to the Philippines 15 times from April 2013 to April 2016, allegedly to abuse kids. He also made several payments to Margallo in exchange for services involving the abuse of children. Marshall Ruskin has a deep knowledge of computers and knows what to do to make online trails disappear with ease. To sum it up, he's a slippery lizard. In 2019, some of his devices were seized, but police have yet to get past the encryption on them. They've had to reapply several times just to keep them in their possession. Also, according to a CBD.ca news quote, Ruskin offered a confidential informant $1,000 to have the informant's four-year-old daughter undress in front of him, police say. They also say Ruskin offered the informant $2,000 to have her daughter perform oral sex on him. The police reports say Ruskin paid an informant $100 for a date with a 14-year-old girl, who turned out to be 21. Ruskin told sex workers that he had two apartments, one where he lived with his wife and another that he took sex trade workers to, according to the court documents. The police report says in 2013, a confidential informant reported a disturbing incident involving Ruskin to police. Ruskin told that informant his fantasy was to break into a little girl's room and force himself onto her and have her fight him off, pushing his chest, the search warrant documents say. A police document states that there are 10 instances on record where Ruskin drew the attention of the Canadian authorities. When Marshall was detained on a search warrant after traveling back from the Philippines in December of 2013, border agents found condoms and venereal disease medication that indicated his travel reasons were sexually based. A confidential informant even reported in 2011 that Marshall Ruskin was known for seeking underage hookups in exchange for cash. Ruskin, now in his 60s, is a former civilian webmaster for the Department of National Defense in Winnipeg. Authorities claim it's hard to move on Ruskin without getting into those devices, and any help by way of Filipina authorities has been minimal at best. He, to my knowledge, while wanted in the Philippines, has yet to be charged for anything in Canada. He's currently said to be living freely in Garden City with his near 30-year-old Filipino wife, where he works from home for clients all around the world. The names Ingo Jerez, Christian Bogo, and Jens Van Dijk also appeared in the case files as people under investigation in regards to dealing with Peter Scully. Liza, the 11-year-old that was sent to Scully in 2012 on promise of a better life, survived the ordeal, but obviously... She's been left with horrible trauma that she'll probably never shake off. Liza claims Scully and Margallo abused her, but she states she was also forced to be cyber abused via Skype at the hands of other paying customers that include Marshall Ruskin, who would pay to watch Scully and Margallo hurt her. There were three male clients that abused Liza, and all three of them were North American. Liza, now married, had a son, but he unfortunately passed away. She was in college but was forced to drop out because her government funding stopped when she became of legal age. 18-month-old Daisy also survived and was rescued, but it's reported that she was so badly damaged that she'll likely never fully recover from her injuries both physically and mentally. Sadly, 12-year-old Barbie met a terrible fate that saw her strangled to death by Scully with a rope on camera before being buried in a shallow grave beneath the kitchen floor of the house. A hole she too was forced to dig herself. Confessions from Lazelle Margallo led authorities directly to her body.
did you want to help the children at the time? Would you like? I wasn't around when when he even done he did when he did this. Oh. I wasn't around at all. Well, how did you know where this girl was if you weren't around? He told me. He told me everything. It took seven years and 45 witnesses to put Scully and Margallo away. In 2018, the two were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Then in November of 2022, the pair were sentenced to another 120 plus years each for a second batch of crimes relating to No Limits Fun. Carmi and Alvarez is also serving a life sentence. Prosecutors hated Scully so bad that they wanted the death penalty reinstated so he could be taken out via a firing squad. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. According to Scully's former lawyer, Alondra Palugna, Scully was treating jail like some kind of resort. He had a list of demands including a cell phone, fresh meat by way of beef, chicken, and pork, and even insisted on having an electric fan because he was too hot. Such a pathetic piece of shit. There were probably a whole host of other crimes and cases to be made against Peter Scully, but sadly and magically, a mysterious fire at the Cagayan de Oro Hall of Justice destroyed almost all the physical evidence against him. This includes a video camera, computer, and a memory card. No details about how the fire started were ever revealed, but it took out a lot of important information. Alondra Palugna felt that due to this, Scully was likely to walk free. But let me tell you something about this piece of shit lawyer whose full name is Alondra Jose C. Palugna. In April of 2012, a children's rights organization rescued several female children who were being prostituted in the streets of Cagayan de Oro City. One of the victims was a 10-year-old who filed a complaint against an American man named Michael John Collins and his female accomplice Sheena Choi Choi Maglente. They were accused of rape and trafficking the 10-year-old. Charges against Sheena were dropped, but they were going ahead for Michael Collins. On August 4th of 2012, the kids that were rescued by the Children's Rights Organization ran away from the shelter and ended up in Gaston Park where a woman named Pretty May found them. Pretty May was none other than the wife of American Michael John Collins. She took the kids, including the 10-year-old in question, straight to Michael. They kept the kids held up in a house and refused to let them leave. Luckily, they managed to escape and made their way back to the shelter. It was the first of many attempts of Collins' crew to get a hold of the children. In late November of 2012, Sheena and two other unidentified women managed to kidnap the 10-year-old I mentioned before and made her go to the residence of a certain lawyer. Luckily, a social worker for the children's rights organization spotted her and took her in. The 10-year-old was standing outside the Flamenco Cafe and Bar in Cagayan de Oro City. The bar was owned by guess who? Alondra Palugna, Scully's former lawyer and Michael Collins' lawyer. Michael John Collins was arrested in early 2016. His case was to be tried in April of 2016, but the 10-year-old victim, now 15, was repeatedly paid directly by Palugna not to show up and testify against Collins. Alondra Palugna did something similar with another case where claims were made against Collins in 2010. These were also underage allegations. This slimy little bastard repeatedly broke countless laws to keep a rapist predator out of jail and pervert the course of justice. So who's to say he didn't have a hand in the fire that destroyed evidence against Scully and God knows who else? As a matter of fact, who's to say Michael John Collins and Scully aren't connected? They operated around the same times in the same area. Who knows? What we do know is snaky little Alondra Palugna has recently been banned from practicing law due to the actions I've just disclosed. Thankfully, he won't be defending any more pedophiles in court. But we do know that Palugna did everything he could to contact the families of Scully's victims to try and pay them to drop the cases. But thankfully, the victims were already in the witness protection program and that wormy little lawyer was unsuccessful. But with No Limits Fund so lucrative, who were on the list of Scully's clients? How many other victims were there? Will we ever know? Are there other videos floating around out there somewhere? There was a rumor of another No Limits Fun film in circulation called Da Fu Love, but only a few whacked out crackpots claim to have seen it. By all accounts, it's genuinely an urban legend. And with Daisy being the youngest official victim on Scully's record, the details I've heard regarding the happenings in Da Fu Love simply don't add up. If this video does exist, 
It's likely not a part of NLF. And even more likely, it's nothing more than a sick urban legend based on the actual atrocities committed by Scully and his crew. There is one of Peter's victims that's unaccounted for and has never been found. But to my knowledge, her details have never been released. Scully admitted to writing a journal regarding his thoughts and plans to detail an account of the evil things he did. As much as I can't stand this evil man, I certainly hope he drops some names. One of the greatest interviews I've ever seen regarding monsters like this was conducted via 60 Minutes Australia when the ever-fearless Tara Brown went head-to-head -head with Peter and tore that coward down. It was clear that her unbreaking eye contact, coupled with unflinching questions, ate into his rotten soul, and it was a pleasure to watch. Peter was forced to submit to the control of a woman who wasn't scared of him, and I truly feel she took a piece of him with her that day. Fair play to you, Tara. Hell of a woman. What was the reaction when you were arrested? Did you feel as pathetic as you looked? Thank you. I didn't think about that. You told me earlier that uh, you, you weren't a pedophile in Australia. Is that true? Hmm. Hmm. No victims in Australia? Of course not. What about your own children? No. No way. Oh, that shocks you, does it? It shocks me. It shocks me that you asked that. We believe that there is still one girl missing. Where is she? From now on, my answer will be, everything will be in the journal. You can keep asking questions, but that will be my answer. Is she alive? Everything will be in the journal. Anyway, um, are we almost done? Because we're going around in circles. I'm not finished yet. All right. What we're interested in mm. is, is whether you have any remorse, mm. whether you admit to what you've done, mm. which is sexual abuse, mm. And of course, murder. Hmm. Of course, I have remorse. Why, of course. Why well, do you think you, people don't have remorse? No, I'm, I'm asking you, as somebody who is a repeat offender here, mm -hmm. who went on the run, who's only mm -hmm. here because you've been caught, not because you turned yourself in, mm -hmm. at what point do you actually feel sorry for what you've done? Is it at the point where you're captured? Oh, that's a good question, actually. That's a, that's a good question. Well done. <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, at what point do you feel remorse comes when you finally realise the extent of what you've done? And at what point uh, was that? At what point was that? Well, I can't answer that honestly yet. What is it about you, Peter, that hates children and women so much? I might address that in the journal. It just got crazier and crazier for you and sicker and sicker. And you'd already committed murder. Where was it going to end? Like, where? what was the next level for you? There was no next level. And as a parent, how can you reconcile what you've done to children? Next question, please. Do you accept that you were ruining their lives as soon as you came in touch with them? In the journal. So you really have no sympathy for these people, for these kids? That is definitely in the journal. I think we are finished. I think we are. Uh, okay. He can get up. Get up, please. I'm not sure how to end this video. I feel there's so much more work to be done to save children from monsters like these. Sometimes I feel helpless like all I can do is make people aware of what really happens out there. That, and try and make sure my own kid is looked after. I've said it before, spend time with them, keep an eye on them, love them, raise them right. And whatever you do, don't let them out of your sight. Rest in peace, Barbie, and I wish a full recovery to the survivors and their families. But skeptically, I wonder if this is even possible for some of these victims. Even though the main perps in this story are serving time and have been stripped of their freedom, I still feel like there's no happy way to end this story. And this is the disturbing truth. We missed the fight.
final call The writing's on the wall 